Hello and welcome to Masterclass number nine. My name is Morag Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute and tonight's topic is all about 10 great permaculture plants, how to grow, harvest and use them. I have to say that it was a pretty challenging task to to find fine tune this down to 10 because I have so so many plants which I find absolutely wonderful that weave together to make the cultivated ecology the diverse and resilient and robust food system that I'm trying to create in and around the gardens that I work with. Uh, So I I think there's probably well over 200 plants in my garden alone but I wanted to focus in on 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 this some of the key plants that I find a really useful one to help gardens get started and two to keep the structure and to keep the system going. Now I know that many of you are coming to this workshop from all around the world and some of the particular plants may not be specifically relevant but what I am going to talk about as I go through are the qualities of these plants and perhaps some of the alternatives that you might be able to use even if these ones aren't directly relevant to you. So I I hope this is relevant to everyone who's attending and um, I, I hope we I hope you have a great time. Stick around at the end to to ask lots of questions. I wanted to let you know before I got started about my new online permaculture educators course. I've woven together the permaculture design certificate and a permaculture teacher certificate as a comprehensive online program. This isn't available anywhere else. So I'm really excited about how it's developing. We have people from all around the world participating at the moment and I'm open to people registering at any time. I do have a special offer for people who attend tonight's workshop. Uh, If you register by the 7th of August, so a week from now, to save $400 off your registration. Uh, You can find out more information at the website there, but I am going to give you the special code to get the discount at the end of this session. So let's just explore for a minute why we want to look at these 10 great permaculture plants. Essentially, a lot of the plants that I'm going to be talking about are multifunctional. They provide abundant food, natural medicine, they create fantastic habitat for wildlife and and other species which become helpers in your system. They help to feed and protect the soil. They improve the microclimate in a variety of different ways. And really importantly too for me, they're very low maintenance and they're incredibly hardy. So the first one I wanted to mention, and I know this is something that people can grow in most parts of the world, and pumpkin, I would have to say, is one of my all-time favourites in the garden for so, so many reasons. Those of you who've come along to talks and workshops that I've done in and around the region will have heard me espouse the values of pumpkin enormously. Now, I want to start firstly that, you know, every single part of the pumpkin is edible. Now, when I first discovered this, I was absolutely blown away because typically, you know, you wait for that beautiful orange fleshed pumpkin to be ready and and you ignore the rest. It's just kind of this sprawling great mass. When I discovered that pumpkin leaves were edible, it was absolutely ground shattering for me because there was this enormous abundance of food that was available for such a longer period of time than what the pumpkins were were available. So actually this is something that I have as one of my main leafy greens. I eat it every day that the pumpkins are sprawling out. I go and snip off the ends. It keeps the pumpkin vine in check but at the same time it is providing you with an abundance of food. So I always just lightly steam them and that gets rid of any of the sort of little fluffy feeling of it which was the thing that made me wonder about eating it in the first place but I remember being in Korea teaching permaculture and in front of us with this beautiful array of vegetables and tofus and and um, chili dips and there was these magnificent great big leaves that they would so they would put on their plate and load up with a bit of rice and a bit of vegetables and wrap them all up and then dip them in this beautiful dipping sauce And I thought, oh, how magnificent. I wonder what they are. They look very much like pumpkin leaves. And well, lo and behold, they were. And so ever since that time, I've been using pumpkin leaves pretty much every day as a food um, while they're in the garden. And that's quite a lot of the year that they're there. Pumpkin leaves are also a fantastic plant to grow up and over fences to create shade. I often use them to grow up over the edge of my chicken run to shade the chickens in summer um, to give them a 
a better microclimate and, and also something to peck on as well. Now, pumpkins provide, as you know, as they grow, they have an enormous amount of, of organic matter that they're producing. So this I use to add into compost, into, um, into mulch, uh, when it's both as a living mulch, but also as a dried mulch. So when it's finished, I bundle the whole big lot up and I, I lay it down on the ground and just let it rot down in situ. And then I come along and I just plug in a few other seeds in amongst it and they come up. So it's this whole no dig self mulching uh, system that starts to happen. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. The pumpkin provides so much in so many different ways from food. Now, I mentioned the leaf, but of course there's all that magnificent flesh which you can use for so many different things. But I also eat the skins and quite often I just leave the skins on and, and stick them into the soup as well as the seeds too and they go in but the children also like to have them as little pumpkin chips so I, I when I slice them off the edge just a drizzle of olive oil and a bit of rosemary and I just gently roast or toast those and they're absolutely delicious the same thing I do with the seeds I scoop out the seeds out of the middle and just wash them off a little bit put them on a, on a sandwich press even and put the sandwich press down toast them a bit put a bit of tamari or soy sauce on and they're magnificent high protein snack um, so it's thinking about actually how to to grow pumpkin and in terms of doing this I often suggest that people start to think like a pumpkin so you know imagine you're a pumpkin what is a pumpkin for the pumpkin itself that big orange fleshy uh, material we always think of it's for us but actually the purpose of the pumpkin is to feed the seeds inside. So if you want to get a really fantastic self-seeded pumpkin patch going, actually leave a whole pumpkin rotting in the ground. And so it provides all the nutrients and the enzymes and as it's breaking down, that is the perfect environment for the new pumpkin pumpkins to come up. So, you know, that's kind of an approach I like to think about in, in getting a whole lot of different plants happening that we think in, for ourselves that we like to have whole foods but the same goes for all life so the whole food for a pumpkin for pumpkin seeds is the whole of the pumpkin itself now I couldn't go past doing a 10 great permaculture plants talk without talking about comfrey now comfrey is one of the most essential plants I think in terms of getting a permaculture garden happening and particularly one of those ones that I plant very early on in a system to build up the soil to provide mulch to to um, create organic matter to create natural edges that I can build up material within um, they provide weed barriers so as you're getting your system happening you can create this great big line of comfrey and then you can mulch on one side and keep that fully mulched and help to try and protect it from the weeds coming through because it's got this sort of dense mat of stalks and deep roots and big broad leaves it actually does act as a quite a significant weed barrier I also plant comfrey around the edge of my chicken pen and the chickens poke their heads out and they they peck away at it so that way it doesn't completely get decimated I couldn't possibly plant it inside of a chicken pen I always plant comfrey around a, a compost system as well because by putting when I put materials into the compost if I add a few handfuls of comfrey at the same time it helps to activate it's really high in, in nitrogen and it helps to really help things break down and speed up I also have great big barrels full of water which I load up with comfrey leaves consistently to make a constant batch of comfrey tea which is a natural fertilizer that I put back out over the garden. Now a traditional name of comfrey is knit bone and it's well known that it helps to heal um, broken bones or sprains or bruises so it's a valuable plant to have uh, particularly in close around the house if you do get sprains or bruises that I make a poultice out of it and, and I stick it straight on to, the, to where the problem is and strap it on and it helps significantly. So it has very big deep roots that go right down into the soil and accumulating nutrients and minerals, bringing them up to the leaves. 
And it's because of this that I actually plant it in and around my fruit trees. And I find that the trees that I have comfrey planted nearby seem to do much better than the ones that don't have that association with a comfrey or other dynamic accumulators for that matter. So comfrey has so many different uses. When I'm making a no-dig garden, I grab great big armfuls of it and lay it down as part of the mix. So within the no-dig garden, underneath my weed barrier and mulch, I add it in with the compost to help improve the compost and add extra organic matter and bulk into that too. So comfrey is a really valuable plant in many, many different ways. It's very easy to propagate. You just need to dig up a little section and, and split the root and then you can divide it up. Now, I warn people, however, though, that if you do start to, if you dig in your garden and chop the root up, you will get multiple plants. So if you are, if you are a digger and a chopper, then don't put your comfrey in that part of the garden, put it out on the edges. If you're a no dig gardener, then it can go in and around the edges quite safely. I found uh, particularly with these, um, with comfrey that if I simply put some newspaper or uh, and mulch over the top of a plant that I don't want anymore, it's gone. A lot of people worry about comfrey spreading, but if you use the, the Bocking 14 or the, the non-fertile varieties, it's an absolutely invaluable plant that should not be shied away from. I think it's, it's such a, a really valuable plant and, it's, and it can be grown all around the world. And it's so abundant and, and forthcoming in the way that you can take pretty much all of its leaves off one day and very soon it will have multiple leaves on again. So it just keeps producing and producing throughout the year as a source of really valuable um, materials for your garden system. Society garlic is a really fantastically useful little plant and I have it scattered all the way through my garden and all the way along the edges of vegetable gardens. It's a plant that I use every day, almost every meal. If you're making an omelette for breakfast, it'll be in that, it'll be chopped up in a salad or the flowers sprinkled on top. It, it will be added into um, curries or quiches or bakes or anything savory. This plant is fabulous. It has the garlic oil in it and I find actually the flowers are more potent than the leaves themselves. So the, the flavor is magnificent. I even make pesto using um, society garlic as the garlic instead of garlic itself. So it really is a really viable alternative to growing garlic. And particularly if you live in a, a subtropical environment like me where uh, growing garlic is a little bit marginal and also, you know, you run out of it if you don't plant enough because it, it's only, you know, in seasonal batches. This is in the garden all year round. It's always there to go and harvest from and it's a perennial plant. So if you separate out one of those clumps that you can see there and you'll probably get maybe a hundred little stalks from each one of those plants, you can plant those out and within another year you have another hundred stalks. But I tend to just leave them in the ground and snip off the leaves and just keep taking the abundance inside. So it's a really very easy, super hardy plant to have in the garden. It can be grown in many different environments. It's drought tolerant, it's it's kind of flood tolerant, it it stands up nice and tall during the day. It doesn't sort of flop over like other little chives that I've that I've tried to grow here as well. So this is why I do grow it within my garden because it's a it's always there always has good structure, has great color, has so many different uses, and it's very functional in terms of the way that I can grow it along the edge of a pathway and it helps to hold back my mulch and give structure to the garden bed itself without actually even having to have garden edging. Mustard greens are such a favorite of mine in, in an edible landscape. They are an annual and I'm quite often heard talking about perennializing your garden but this is one of the annuals that I really do love and it's not something actually that I plant it's something that is self-seeding every year it comes back and there's different sorts that come back there's the red mustard spinach this beautiful one here on the right I had the big green mustard spinach there's frilly ones there's all different types of mustard greens that come back now what I love about well, there's many things I love about the mustard greens but one of the things uh, that I like about it is that it's for me it's an indicator species when I see the mustard greens first starting to self seed in the garden in different places I know that it's getting to the point of being cool enough to plant all my other 
brassicas in. Now, I think this idea of actually noticing what's going on in your garden, noticing what things are coming up, gives you the gives you the chance to really connect with how your very localized seasons are changing. Because we can look at a chart, but the chart only tells us a, a rough approximation. Your observation of what's actually going on in your garden is the real guide. So I find it very useful to notice these types of things. And, and I really value the role that mustard spinach plays or mustard greens, mustard spinach, the same, same thing that I find these really useful in that way. And they're so abundant. I mean, just look at the size of the, these leaves. They're, they're huge. So a couple of those in a, in a curry or a stir fry or a soup or a salad is all you need. So I find that I'm, I'm constantly uh, have an abundance of mustard greens that are available and they just keep self-seeding throughout the season. So I constantly have a spray of new ones coming up and then they're in all different stages of their life. Now the thing too about mustard greens is all of it's edible. So when they're just very young, the young leaves are edible. So I just gently take those off and, and allow the main plant to come up and then big leaves start to form and I'm harvesting those regularly and then after a while they, they go to seed quite quickly but when they do start to go to seed you'll see these big shoots coming up like this picture on the on the left now that is edible too that I consider as a vegetable so I chop it off and I slice it up and I cook that up in a stir fry or whatever it might be and it's really lovely. It's kind of like a spicy asparagus. Now, what that means is it just makes the plant last a bit longer. So it keeps throwing up more shoots, trying to get to, you know, seed the, its seed stage. And so I have a constant source of that for a while. Then after a while, I, I kind of miss that and it goes up even further and it starts to form like this picture in the middle, the little seed pods which are just starting to form there and the flowers and the flowers are edible so you can eat the flowers you can eat the mini seed pods they taste uh, just like little spicy peas and after a while when those seed pods dry they go brown on the stem and when they go brown you can collect them I typically snip off all of those stems and put them into a bag upside down and and sort of bang the bag a bit and all the little black seeds will come out. Another way I do it if I've got a massive great amount is to uh, put a big sheet down on the ground and layer all of the all of the seed heads in that and I roll them up and then I squish it all and all the seeds will fall out and then I can just scoop that into a jar. And so that that black seed is what I use as mustard. So I can use it uh, to make my own curry powders or I can use it to make my own seedy mustard that you might, you know, use as a condiment. So every single part of this plant is edible and it's so simple to grow. It just goes by itself, self seeds, it's abundant, it's versatile. And the extra super bonus of this, I mean, look at the leaves on this. They're almost hole free. There's a couple of holes, but, you know, holes are edible too. They're not absolutely massacred. These, these leaves are mostly disliked by wildlife, so I don't have problems with kangaroos or wallabies or possums. They leave these alone. So it was my strategy very early on to maximize the use of these plants, to create little zones of protection for other plants that the wildlife did like. So it was kind of a bit of a, a trick and it worked magnificently. So by incorporating these into your garden, you can have so many different benefits. And I really encourage you to explore with the different types. The green mustard here on the left is quite a mild flavor. However, the one on the right, the red one, it's gosh, it's more like wasabi. So what I do with that actually is I take a big leaf and if I'm making up some, some nori rolls, I'll lay down the seaweed sheet and then put put a big leaf of that and then the rice and other vegetables inside and roll it up and so it so it kind of has that pack of the wasabi punch right there embedded in the actual um, roll itself. Now another plant I can't go past having right in the middle or multiply through the middle of my permaculture garden is a is some type of perennial basil or sacred basil or different varieties of tulsi. These are perennial basils, basils which grow all year round. Now they have so many different benefits. They've been grown for you know thousands of years uh, in places like India as a very important medicinal plant. 
They're also an incredibly useful culinary plant. I utilize uh, the leaves, the young shoots in particular, in pretty much all of my cooking. And also if I have a sore throat, um, I will take a lot of the leaves and, and use that to make a really great tea with a bit of honey and lemon myrtle and ginger and turmeric and make up a really powerful tea to help um, fight the cold and, and break up um, any infection that might be in my throat. Now, my first reason for planting these in the early days was as a habitat as a way to attract beneficial insects and pollinators into the garden because they flower all the time. They're pretty much almost flower, almost flowering all the time. Now, when you're growing normal sweet basil, typically the thing that you would do would be to cut off all the flowers to make sure that you get a lot more leaf happening. However, with these plants, the, the point is actually to try and encourage as much flowering as possible. Um, what I find with uh, the sweet basil where I live anyway is that after it's flowered it's pretty I pretty much know it's on its way out whereas these they just continue so I leave them to flower and do their own thing and they continue just to make this beautiful little mound of basil that every now and then I just give a little trim to to keep it in shape but it's incredibly low maintenance and it makes a fantastic living hedge that is just buzzing with life and literally this this bush just buzzes pretty much all day long and attracts honeybees and native bees and all different sorts of insects. Now what I do notice too and why I love this plant is that it provides really important habitat for other species that are helping me to make sure that my garden stays relatively you know pest I'm saying pest with exclamation marks pest free. What what happens is that these sorts of little bushes create a, a structure and a habitat and protection for a lot of little birds. Now the little birds are insectary birds. Insectary birds are the ones that come into your garden and pick off all the little slugs and bugs that might be eating your cabbages and other plants, the ones that are more sensitive. So you want to attract them in. Unfortunately in many urban places and in many gardens in, um, all over, uh, a lot of vegetable gardens are way too open and the little birds feel vulnerable. They won't come in they won't stay there because they'll feel they feel threatened that they could be attacked by um, predatory larger birds. So by incorporating into your garden a whole series of little bushes, which can be, um, you know, multifunctional plants that are edible, edible and medicinal and and pollinators and uh, all mulch plants, but have a series of plants all throughout your garden that provides this little sort of corridor of safety for your insectary birds. And I think that's a really important thing to consider so that when we're designing our garden and we're considering what plants to incorporate, we're not just thinking about our needs. We're actually thinking about ourselves as part of an entire ecological system. And we're one of those species that dwell in that. But without all the other species, the system's not really going to work that well. It's going to require so much energy, so much effort, so many, um, you know, so much more extra maintenance or pest management or fertilizing. What you're trying to create is a system that does all of that in and of itself. So this is one of those plants that helps incredibly for that. So if you can find yourself a perennial basil, a tulsi or some kind of sacred basil plant to incorporate, and there are many, many different sorts that you can get, all of them will do this particular um, ecological um, service for you in your garden beautifully. Now pigeon pea is a legume. It's a legume shrub or small tree. So this type of plant, so you maybe be thinking of, you know, maybe a Siberian pea tree in other places, uh, that you can grow in, as a pioneer. So you plant it when your system is really young and it grows up and provides a bit of shade and protection, maybe a bit of a windbreak or a or sun shelter. It provides habitat for uh, for the various other species to come into your garden. The, the leaves that are growing, you can see here, very soft and they break down rapidly and they're easy to take off. The, the stem so you can just easily snap off a branch and, and strip off the leaves and use it as a chop and drop. And then you can see that there's lots and lots of um, pods on here. So every plant that has pods is a legume. So legumes help to fix nitrogen in the soil. So it's, an, it's improving the soil at the same, same time. And every time you're actually trimming the top, 
it's releasing extra nitrogen back into the soil like a slow release fertilizer and when this plant dies after four or five years it's just a short-lived pioneer plant um, the, the roots will break down and release even more so you're not only adding mulch and shade and protection and biomass and organic matter you're also adding directly into the soil as well as providing a great source of food and for thousands of years this particular plant has been uh, a source of dal in India so the pigeon pea is really really useful um, chickens also love it and they really benefit from being fed uh, pigeon peas and that that will help to boost up their production of eggs and make them really healthy um, I also use it in my garden as I mentioned as a little bit of a, a windbreak or a shade shade and protection so if you notice there's a uh, in your design you're planning to think about having a, a windbreak in a particular location but it's going to take a while until your windbreak gets established because those trees do take some time but you want to get a garden started now right up near your house and you need to provide some protection well these this is a type of plant that you can grow that will grow rapidly and be able to do this job for you so over time as your larger windbreak might be established uh, you've got this one as an intermediate and then you can kind of gradually I guess take it out it's a pioneer it doesn't need to be there all the time it can move further afield into a food forest or to the edges and not be so much in your main vegetable garden area but I have found it absolutely invaluable particularly in subtropical gardens as an as a pioneer species of getting my um, food system going and this one too edible canna my gosh I don't know what I would have done without edible canna canna edulis now there are so many different sorts of cannas in the world and most of them aren't edible uh, it's this one here and you can tell because it has this purpley ready color right at the base of the stalk and when you look down close at the level of the soil you can see these swollen corms here and it's this the swollen rhizome this is what you actually want to eat it's fantastic food it's my potato alternative and what I love about this as being a potato is that I actually don't need to pull up the plant I don't need to dig around underneath the soil and fossicking looking for potatoes in the soil but I mean I love doing that too but this particular plant means that all I need to do is take a knife and I just look around in the mulch and I look for a plant that's just about to shoot like this one is right here and I just gently slice it off and then take it inside and that's my potato and you can see on the other side there's another one coming out so I'll wait you know another week or so and I'll come back to this plant and then that one can be chopped off and then by that time there'll be another one so I just move my way through the canna patch just taking off one here and one there and always leaving kind of the mother plant I suppose in the ground and it will last there for years and years and years and by doing that you're managing your clump you're at the same time you're not disturbing the soil because they all grow just on the top like this which is just so handy really when you think about it now so that that's a, that's food enormous amount of food absolutely enormous amount of food that you can get from that I can't actually eat as much food as what this produces so so I, I don't try and eat all of it because I actually want a lot of it to to grow up tall which and then I chop it back regularly right down to about you know maybe six to twelve inches off the ground and this is my chop and drop mulch and it just keeps growing and growing and so it's a constant source of material that I can use to mulch uh, my in my vegetable garden in my um, in my no dig gardens when I'm making those to add into compost systems to put around fruit trees I also grab great big handfuls bundle loads of them and put them in the chicken pen now what that what happens is as the chickens start to come up and and they eat the leaves a bit but then as the stalks start to break down in the chicken pen all these little bugs and grubs are coming up into it and so that's extra protein for the chicken so it it doubles as a, a sort of the greens and the bugs and when I'm finished in the, when they're finished and the chicken pens being raked down all that material ends up in the compost anyway so it gives me an extra use of the plant on its way through and feeds the chickens and like with the pigeon pea this plant is also a really useful one to have as a pioneer to create those in garden windbreaks and shade uh, particularly I really like these particularly as a summer vigorous plant uh, because what happens is that they 
they grow up fast in the in the warmer times and then they die back so it provides that really nice uh, shade for my my lettuce garden and my salad garden in the summertime but then in the winter time it, when it's died back it allows the sun to come through but they don't completely die back in the winter they just slow down so it has this sort of cycles through the year so what are some of the other plants that you might be able to use that you know of that have this abundance growth of of top uh, so I mean it's a different type of plant I think um, because it's an, it's an annual but in terms of that biomass one of the things that I really like for cool climates is the daikon radish because it has those big deep roots that go down they're helping to open up the soil at the same time as this massive top on them that you can chop and drop uh, so you know there's a whole range of different plants that you could think of, of using even Jerusalem artichokes in some places would be a fantastic thing to think about because they have, you know, taller growth habit and lots of root material that you can harvest. Lemon myrtle, I have planted quite close. You can see in the picture, it's pretty close to my veranda. And it's a plant that I come out and I harvest again regularly, pretty much every day. I just harvest the little leaves and they go in to make a cup of tea. Just one or two leaves in some hot water makes a beautiful cup of refreshing lemon zingy tea. And it's actually really nice to blend either with some rose, dried rosella leaves or some ginger. It makes a really nice combination. So having your own tea garden is a really wonderful thing. There are so many different sorts of plants that you can grow as your own tea. And I like this because there are so many, I think there's billions of tea bags that are created uh, that are used every day and I was actually surprised uh, not that long ago to find out that most tea bags aren't actually biodegradable that probably about 20 to 30 percent of the tea bag itself uh, is made of plastic so that's pretty disappointing so <laughs> I've made a really concerted effort uh, to try to keep getting rid of bits of plastic out of out of our lifestyle and by growing our own teas, this is one of the things you can do. But lemon myrtle is so much more than that. It is a, it's a local native to here. So I encourage you to think about what are the local native indigenous trees in your area that you can grow in your garden and, and possibly keep small. This tree can get absolutely massive, you know, eight to 10 meters, but I constantly keep it just within arm's reach so that I can pick off all the nice little shoots and it keeps it small. It stops the roots from being too big in the in the garden right next to the house but it does provide me with a lot of different value in terms of its flavor its medicine its tea it's I use the leaves in soups and I use it to um, flavor baked goods um, it's also when I trim it back I get a lot of biomass which can be used as mulch I can also when I'm trimming back some of the bigger branches use that as a as a fuel as a firewood and I also can be drying a lots of those leaves that I harvest regularly and using that to sell. So creating an income from this up through the branches. I can use it as a trellis to grow some climbing plants and it provides dappled shade for things like my bird bath, which the birds love to come in and visit and they nice and protected underneath this tree. But also I grow my aloe vera underneath this, which does like a bit of, of dappled shade and some other more sensitive herbs that like that that environment so create having a tree crop in your having a tree in your vegetable garden is not probably the the most natural thing to think of but I've actually found it incredibly useful so I now have um, things like pomegranates and well the pigeon peas of course the lemon myrtles and dwarf citrus trees and I've actually created a vegetable garden that is integrated with uh, small trees and shrubs and herbs so it, so it's like a forest garden I guess now aloe vera is another plant that I just love and use every day and it's one of those plants that I find particularly useful to help me get rid of plastic in my household too um, our family always participates in the plastic free July campaign and one of the things that we did a few years back when the kids were, um, came out shopping with me, we wrote a list of all the things that we needed and we went off to the shops. 
And we actually came back with very little of them because everything was in plastic and everything was wrapped in plastic, maybe once or twice. And some of the things that we, you know, we hadn't really thought about before were things like conditioners and and creams and all that kind of stuff. So this, I, I did a lot of research and now this is what I use whenever I wash my hair. I use just a natural liquid soap to wash it and then come outside and I grab a leaf of this, open it up and just put it all through my hair and it makes this most magnificent leave-in conditioner. And, you know, a little bit of styling as well, I suppose, not that I'm um, particularly into that, but, you know, it, it for my curly hair, it's great because it stops, as they say, the flyaways. So I find it really useful. It's really fantastic as a conditioner. Um, and while you're there, uh, I, I while I'm there I I use the rest of it to put on my face so it's a fantastic face cream and put it up up on my arms and elbows it's great for for rough skin knees so you can kind of get this all over uh, body conditioning straight from this plant that's right in front of your door it's I also have it in front of the door because it's it's brilliant if you have burns or cuts uh, or insect bites so the kids know if they you know if they do get burned or I'm hoping they don't ever get sunburned that they're being sun safe but if they do they know that they can go straight here open it up and put it on um, same with bites because it's very cooling uh, internally you can eat it as well so what I do is I open it up and I remove all of I remove all of the green and I also wash it off because there's a little bit of a liquid around the outside of the clear gel inside that can be irritating for some people. So it's always best to wash that off. Just simply run it underneath the tap and and then you can put that into smoothies or juices. And it is a fantastic digestion aid and detoxification. And it's uh, so you can have it in the juices or smoothies, but uh, you can also make a dessert from it. There's a um, an Asian dessert which uses aloe vera gel. And there's a friend of mine also told me that they just julienne sliced it very finely and added it into salad with sauces and dressings and things. And that's fantastic too. You know, I wouldn't just sit there and eat on a chunk of, of aloe vera gel or just drink it straight because I find it a little bit bitter. Although some people do, they just grab a chunk of it and leave it in a glass of water and allow it to sit and it becomes this great big sort of gel mass, which is quite extraordinary but it's so so valuable so for externally and internally now I also really like it because it seems to be a really great spot that frogs hide out in my garden too I'm always finding little green tree frogs hiding in amongst in there so as you can see from this picture this is this is my garden there's you know I've got the oranges behind there's mint crawling around I've got the aloe vera um, garlic uh, chives here in the front and there's just so much going on and so all of these different plants are finding their little niches and are available and accessible and are abundant so I, I don't always harvest from the same plant so I have you know multiple aloe vera's around so that today I'll grab a plant from this one and then the next day I'll grab a uh, leaf from the next one and so on and so forth and that way pretty much as you're harvesting you, you're just foraging and you're not damaging each plant and you kind of look to the plant uh, an, an Aboriginal friend told me this. They sort of look at a plant and they think, well, where's the best spot to harvest from that's creating the least impact? And I really love that approach. It's not just, okay, well, I'm it's my plant and I'm going to harvest what I want. It's actually looking to the plant and letting it determine for you where is the best place to harvest. And the final plant I wanted to talk about is turmeric. And turmeric for me is in this in a subtropical garden is a very um, wonderfully easy plant to grow all I need to do is take a little chunk of the turmeric and stick it in the ground in a warm time around October and up it comes and it's just magnificent so what are other sorts of roots root crops that you could possibly grow that are medicinal this is particularly because it's a medicinal plant as well as culinary and and for flavors as well um, so, you know, perhaps golden seal or horseradish. What other sorts of spices too can you grow in your garden? Spices, medicines and dyes. Uh, quite often uh, I'm starting to see in more places, as well as tea gardens, dye gardens. What are the plants that we can grow in and around our garden that can help us to uh, move away from fast fashion and to actually be growing our own uh 
materials that we can use to to color fabric and we just get natural organic fabric and use our plants from the garden to dye them it's absolutely a wonderful thing and it helps us sort of decolonize our homes and deplasticize our, our lives and to to move away from the sort of the wasteful consumerism so all of these plants as well as being just personally healthy for us they're also part of a a global health strategy as well you know it's always this sort of local and global simultaneously we don't have to work at one level or the other actually by working locally in your garden you are contributing to that global change bill mollison once said that you know permaculture is actually a revolution disguised as gardening and you know you it's it's remarkable what you can do and what you can shift and what you can inspire through simply making changes, you know, in your own garden. So turmeric is, is renowned as a medicinal plant and it's one of the ones that you can use to, to add into all different sorts of meals. Now, I much prefer to use turmeric fresh straight out of the garden rather than drying it because when you, when you start to dry it, it loses its potency. Actually, 75% of its value is said to be lost through, the pro, through processing it. So as much raw as possible... The best way I've found to store raw turmeric is because this particular clump here was five kilos of turmeric. It was absolutely phenomenal clump. I think it had been growing for maybe two years in that one spot. That's how it got so massive. So turmeric, when you dig it up like this, I just wash off the soil and allow the skin to just harden and dry a little bit. So leave it out up on the on the terrace wall for a, you know a few days. And then I separate it out and I bury it into a a bucket of sand. And a just moist sand, playground sand is perfect. And this way, what I found is if you put it in the freezer, it goes all mushy. If you store it in the fridge, it goes a bit moldy. If you store it on the shelf, it just kind of gradually shrivels over time. Whereas keeping it in this bucket of moist sand, it keeps it nice and plump and fresh. And so you just... Take what you need into the house and leave the rest under the house or in your carport or in the back garden shed or somewhere. And then when you when you need a bit, you just go out and wash off a bit more. You can use do the same thing with gingers and potatoes and sweet potatoes and other root crops as well, because when you think about it, they're all living things. And we tend to forget that, that that when we dig it out of the ground is still a living thing. It's alive and waiting and potent and and it's potential energy waiting to sprout again when the time is right. And you can see already on this plant, all those little nodules, that's where the new shoots are going to come out from. The new roots and the new shoots when you take a section of that and plant it. So, so turmeric not only is the root edible, but also is the leaf. The young leaves can be chopped up in salads or used as just as a leafy spinach green. The larger leaves can be wrapped up around fish and baked that way. And I also really appreciate... Uh, the turmeric in the garden because what it does is provide some of that structure and shade in the summer particularly and because of the form of its leaves what it does it actually acts like a a water harvesting system it collects dew and, and rain and funnels it down into the garden right in situ and so there you know the many many uses again of turmeric um, warrant it to be on my top 10 list so in summary Some of the things I've been talking about. So one is that really I encourage you to eat way more of each plant. There is so much of every plant is edible and we overlook much of that. So if we can really look to each plant and think about how we can eat much more of it, all of a sudden we've probably increased the productivity and abundance in our garden 10 times, tenfold, simply by changing our perception about what it is that we have in our garden. So you can grow your own teas and your own medicines and your own beauty products. Um, You can actually think about growing for the soil. So what are the plants that you're growing that contribute to the well-being of the soil? What are the plants that you can grow that contribute to mulch, which means that you're not having to bring um, imports of mulch from elsewhere? Um, What are the plants that you can grow that create habitat for all all the beneficial species that create the ecology that makes your permaculture garden really fabulous. I, I certainly encourage you um, to facilitate self-seeding in your garden. You know, the, I don't think I don't remember the last time I planted pumpkins or tomatoes or um, mustard spinaches and all 
um, passion fruits even, a whole range of different things just keep coming back. So by focusing on the soil, you can encourage that self-seeding to take place. And to really think every time you're planting something, um, to try and select something that's as multifunctional as possible and think of all the different ways that you can you can use that plant, but not just purely as a use function as it's there for you, but as, you know, as part of that whole ecological system. How can you weave it in and integrate it best as possible for it to actually be a fully flourishing member of that community? Um, and so also part of that is about growing more perennials and trees too so that it's it's more like a a forest garden system and and you're needing to dig less and and interact um sort of what well, you want to interact but you don't want to necessarily have to be there as a as the maintainer and the manager you're really just a participant in it when the more perennials and more trees you have you become part of the system much more and you know a lot of all of this too then helps you to reduce plastic waste because you're not buying food uh, that's wrapped in plastic or teas that are wrapped in plastic tea bags or medicines that are in plastic tubs or conditioners that come in plastic tubes and so on and so forth. So this whole way of thinking about your garden and, and having a diversity of different plants and a multifunctional can help you to achieve this and more. So just as a reminder, I started out telling you about um, my new online permaculture educators course, which really is focused on cultivating your confidence as a permaculture educator. And that may be to teach permaculture design certificate courses, or it may be to teach your children. It might be to teach people in a community garden or at a local school garden, or even just one-on-one -on -one when, you, when you're doing designs for people to actually see that as a mentoring. Permaculture teaching is such a broad thing it doesn't have to be just you know the pdc the permaculture design certificate course so uh, this program is open now it's available for you to sign up anytime um, it's actually a, a 10 month program uh, with about two to three hours a week uh, although some people are doing it now saying they wish they had about two weeks to do each module but there is no limit in time there's no deadlines the pace is up to you however long it takes you to do it is up to you so uh, register by the 7th of August uh, so that's a week from now and you can save $400 on the registration of this course so it's only two thousand just under two thousand dollars for these two certificates and it, if you use this code this link here permaculture education Institute org slash MC 9 masterclass 9 MC 9 um, that will automatically give you the the four hundred dollars off uh, so Please feel free to share that to with your with your friends and and anyone else that you know. Um, like I said, it's only available for a week, so um, I really do hope that you'll join me. It's been absolutely fantastic so far. We're we're up to module six, uh, and so we're gradually working our way through this course. It only opened six weeks ago, and already we have um, almost a hundred people attending from all around the world and it's absolutely fantastic community of practice with lots of support and information sharing and and resources flying everywhere and people organizing meetups and um, so absolutely fantastic and I really look forward to you uh, joining in on that so thank you so much for attending tonight's masterclass the next masterclass will be on the 27th of August which is a Monday again and I am just going to put up some uh, the the uh, poll for the next topic in a minute, um, and so the topics will be there. Please select which one that you would want the most of, and if there's something else that you would like, um, please feel free to email me. My email is moragamble at permacultureeducationinstitute.org. So again, thank you for joining me. Check out the course. Don't forget, if you want to sign up, use the special MC9 at the end and you'll get $400 off the course for the next week. I look forward to seeing you um, on, on August 27th and I will be sticking around at the end now um, for any to answer any questions and to open this up for discussion.